Crystal Boyer. I'm the president and CEO for National Children's Museum. I want to thank you all so much for taking a little bit of time to be here with us today. We are very, very excited for this discussion. Um, so I want to just note a couple of special guests in the room. You are all very special to us, but we have some of our board members here today. If you could just give a little wave for some of the National Children's Museum board members. Um, this group works incredibly hard to help support the museum. We're very grateful to them. Um, Ginger Z is one of them as well. I hope you waved at everyone hey. from the stage. Um, I want to explain exactly what the round series is and what we're trying to do here. So we have been doing these for about a year and a half now. We've been bringing together thought leaders for different topics. This is one we have been looking forward to for a very long time um, because we know this is incredibly important work and we're very proud of the work uh, and leadership that we're providing in this space. But all of these conversations, we just limit it to 40 people to be in the room because we want it to be a really intentional conversation and a great Q&A. And we do record these uh, for our community and for the museum community at large. So we distribute it through the Association of Children's Museums and uh, Association of Science and Technology Centers and others to make sure that um, we're sharing our resources with this community. So we're going to be affecting uh, real change, I hope, with this, with this dialogue today. Before we get started, I just wanted to tell you that on the back of your place cards, there is a QR code. That is where the digital program is because we are being very conscious of our environment today. Um, the team thought of absolutely everything right now to the pollinator plants on your table. Um, so thank you all so much for helping us stay green today and being a part of that. I hope you all had a chance to walk through the Climate Action Heroes exhibit on your way in and find out what your superpower is. If not, you will find out in just a little bit, but you're sitting at the Arbor Avenger table, the Mighty Meteorologist table. Um, I myself is, am a community captain. If you did not get your pen, you can get that later. Um, but a little bit about National Children's Museum. So the National Children's Museum is uh, a place that has been in Washington, D.C. since 1974, but our mission is to inspire children to care about and change the world. Uh, we can't think of anything more important to change the world um, than climate change education and really empowering this next generation. So we're really proud to be the Science and Technology Center and Children's Museum here in our nation's capital. And we want to make sure that we're really empowering children and doing that in a hopeful way in everything that we do. So I am absolutely thrilled and honored to introduce the panelists that are here and really doing this work every single day. I want to introduce Arthur Affleck, who is the Executive Director of the Association of Children's Museums, Ginger Z, who is ABC's Chief Meteorologist and Climate Unit Managing Editor, and Kim Noble, who is the Senior Advisor for Environmental Education at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency at the EPA. So thank you all so much for coming. Well, climate change, thank you so much. <laughs> While climate change is a collective challenge, young children are most impacted by its present and future consequences. We know that. UNICEF put out a study last year, and in 2021, there were 2.2 billion children in the world, one billion of those children, nearly half, are at extremely high risk of the present consequences of climate change. So Arthur, as a leader of institutions that serve this vulnerable population, how is the Association of Children's Museums committing to work around climate resiliency and sustainability? Well, first of all, I'm thrilled that our board, as we prepared our new strategic plan, had the foresight to include uh, climate and environment in the plan. As a matter of fact, all of our strategic priorities are viewed through two lenses. One, diversity and inclusion, uh, and environment, climate, uh, and resiliency. So everything we do, what that means is that we review everything we do now with an eye toward um, the carbon footprint. Uh, is it reduced? Can we reduce emissions? What should we do differently? And then beyond just the organization, um, that message goes out to the field. And so we are also thrilled to be a part of uh, an organization or an, um, an initiative uh, called Caretakers of Wonder. Um, and that initiative funded by the Institute for Museum and, Li and Museum, Institute for Museum and Library Services, IMLS, that's why we just say IMLS. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that that uh, initiative uh, has a group of museums, a uh, cohort of museums and climate experts working together to do two things. First of all, we've made commitments, and the National Children's Museum is involved. We make commitments uh, to regenerative uh, climate action, 
Uh, and we are developing content for museums around the country, more content, we have some, but more content, age-appropriate content to help young people and families understand climate action and to be able to, to have agency to be involved. So this is, um, nothing is more important than, than this work because we serve children and children are more affected than any other group by uh, climate uh, change issues. So thrilled to be here and thank you for sponsoring this event. Absolutely. Yeah, we're very proud to be a part of the Caretakers of Wonder initiative. There are nine museums, children's museums and science centers that are doing this important work around the country. And it's really about developing that framework for kids, but it's also about institutional change and what we can be doing. And Kim, I know that the EPA is also located in this federal building, the Ronald Reagan building. You would be really surprised how hard it is to recycle at this federal building um, and do a lot of different things. But I think it's been so wonderful because it's inspired us to really take a look at so many things we're doing. We, because we just opened, we were building from the ground up so we could do a lot of things intentionally in our design. Um, and we could pick partners like our cafe partner, Bluestone Lane, that uses compostable materials and no single use plastics. And they're, it's, a great, it's a great cafe partner for us and we were intentional about that. So I'm proud of that work, but we're diving into that even more. Um, this statistic that the team gave me kind of terrifies me. Um, they gave me one from science, uh, from the Journal of Science from 2021 that says children born in 2020 will experience two to seven times as many extreme climate related events as compared to people born in 1960 under current climate policy pledges. My daughter was born on December 29th, 2020. So just knowing that that affects her future so greatly. Um, I, the reality is our world will just look different in the next 10, 20 years. And so Ginger, how can we prepare young people for a future where climate change is a central problem? Hmm. <laughs> I think, I mean, education and opportunity that they would get at something like a museum is, is huge, but you can't do much. What, we can talk about statistics and numbers, and we're all like, wow, those are jaw-dropping. And I actually, the EPA just put out new numbers. I wanted to share one of them because it's so stunning, right, that the um, 4 to 7 percent reductions in annual academic achievement because of heat. Mm. That's coming mm. in, in the next couple of decades. We all understand that, but when you're talking to a child, they're like, what? What does that mean? And just like when I've been in every natural disaster from Katrina on, I went to school to start Storm Chase. I wanted to be Helen Hunt from Twister. That was my intention. <laughs> I don't know how I got here, no. Um, but what I've learned is from Katrina, because that was fast track for me to understand that this isn't about science, it's not about statistics, it's not about how high the water level was, it was about the humanity of the people that I met there. That's what we can give children, not just the education and the information, but where and how do I take action with whatever I have in front of us. And so my son, who's seven, is extremely black and white, as most children are, that's how we all start tough with emotional regulation because he's he, like super, I'm such a bad boy when one thing goes wrong, he's very sensitive. Tough on the psychology part, it's great and I think we need to utilize it for environment and climate because single use plastic, pretty black and white and we know the numbers and we can not use fear but use hope and agency that each child does have agency and has the ability to take action but also more importantly has the ability to vote with their dollar and vote. And I think that's the other part that gets missed within climate education is just that there is something well beyond to not feel that paralyzation because kids are the most motivated. I get notes all the time from producers and people around me at ABC. They're like, you and your stuff are going to make my kids make me get an EV. And I don't have that right now, right? They're the ones that are paying close attention. It is still black and white. And I think you can utilize that because we see it too gray. We're like, ah, oh, man, that stuff was set in stone so long ago, so just kind of what we're used to. No, <laughs> we can do it differently because we should. And that's the humanity of it. And putting that face on it would be really helpful for kids. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, part of this Caretakers of Wonder project, another thing that I've really enjoyed is hearing from different scientists and researchers. Mm -hmm. And one of them um, was an academic that came from New Hampshire to talk to us about climate anxiety in kids. And one of the recent reports that were shared with us said that 59% of children, of young children, are extremely worried 
about the climate. 84% are somewhat worried. So this really isn't, you know, a, um, they're all feeling this way, right? They're feeling this anxiety. And so, um, Kim, I want to know what the EPA, um, what their approach has been to climate education so that we can teach kids about these things that are happening in a way that doesn't scare them. Mm. Yeah. Thank you so much, Crystal. And I really just want to take a moment to thank the Children's Museum for efforts like this. Uh, this is amazing. And uh, thank you for all the programming that you do around exhibits. Um, you really help to show us that environmental protection and educational success are not mutually exclusive. They're two critical pieces of the same puzzle. So with that, thank you for that. Um, so it's a great question because when we think about you know, climate change and the significant impacts. We were talking about this, uh, Ginger, a little bit ago. You know, they're significant. And let's face it, they are scary. Mm -hmm. And there are people across this country, across this planet for that matter, who are feeling these impacts each and every day. And I got a chance recently to speak with some high school students. They came up to DC, right over here in headquarters, and we had a conversation about climate change and these impacts and sustainability and environmental justice. And at the end of that conversation, we asked them, you know, what are you worried about? What, what concerns you the most? And, you know, their answers ranged from air quality, rising sea levels, temperature spikes, displacement of animals, and yeah, all those things, they are scary. But it also lets us know this question that we can talk to children in a way that doesn't just come from a place of fear, but a place of possibility. Mm -hmm. We can confront climate change and talk to our kids in a way that teaches them about creativity, innovation, resilience. We can teach them what it means to imagine a world <laughs> with a planet, with clean air, mm -hmm. clean water for everyone. That learning can come from a place of growth. You know, with those kids, you know, they asked a lot of questions. And we love that. <laughs> they also shared a lot of ideas, and we love that too. Environmental education can go both ways. And I, I love that I get a chance to meet with students and have those types of meaningful discussions. You know, when we talk about environmental education at the EPA, we want to come at it from a way that sparks their imagination and their creativity. And so one of the things that we do best is through our President's Environmental Youth Award program. We talk about a mouthful, we just say PIA. <laughs> <laughs> and PIA is really cool because it gives us the opportunity to recognize and celebrate students K through 12 across the country who are doing outstanding work around environmental stewardship. Now these kids, I tell you, they got it going on. We just announced our 2023 awardees. They're doing projects like cleaning up waterways and planting trees and hydroponics and you know tackling food waste in school cafeterias and much, much more. But these kids, they, they, they are out there doing this amazing work and we wanna celebrate that. And so we take an approach to dealing with climate change in a way that really is rooted in students' own excitement and their passions and not in their fear. Mm -hmm. I love that program so much. We, um, in the museum community, there are a lot of different science centers that are focused on middle school education where they do climate change solution competitions. Mm -hmm. And um, Ginger and I were having a conversation a few months ago where uh, we have always talked about doing an inventor's fair, some kind of innovation fair here. But we also really wanted to do something that was focused on climate change um, education, so some kind of cl climate change summit. Mm -hmm. and, and now I'm thinking we need to work with the EPA and, and bring all these kids here because all of those projects sound so cool. Um, and we need to bring more attention to these kids that are doing this really great, hopeful work. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. Um, so Arthur. Children's Museums, we are all about play, play-based learning. So I, would, I was just wondering if you could speak more to, about why play-based early STEAM learning are critical tools for climate resiliency. Sure, there's now a lot of research to document the proposition that children learn best when they are, when it's hands-on, um, interactive, joyful, playful, in fact. And, um, and there's sometimes a debate about play, 
and whether it's guided play or free play and what's the best. We believe that play is learning full stop. That, and I got that from Fred Rogers, so that's, that's my source. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> play is learning. Play is how children uh, engage with the world. Um, but in museums, we have guided play. So, so we, kids have agency, they move around, but um, they're guided in, and there's a learning objective uh, in, it, in this process. The reason play is so important is that you want the lesson to stick. You want children to um, want to know more about it. And so if you make it fun and you make it interesting and you make it interactive and iterative and joyful, they're likely to get the lesson. And so uh, we use play-based approaches to teach about climate and everything and, and so many other uh, concepts and STEM and STEAM uh, are popular in so many of our museums. And increasingly, um, uh, my board president, Joe Hastings, I visited him in Albuquerque, he's opened a teen center. So in addition to serving the youngest children and families, um, he, he says his, his goal is to serve children from uh, cradle to career. And increasingly, our museums, and this museum serves children of all, of all ages as well. Um, but if you do it in a playful, joyful, iterative, hands-on, interactive way, you're likely to keep their attention, they're likely to learn, and likely to come away with some actionable lessons that um, they might go into the world uh, and then be you know, climate heroes, if you will. That's great. I mean, we all need to play, right? Even the adults. Exactly. When you came through and you saw the Climate Action Heroes installation, that's exactly what we're doing. We have the maze, and I saw so many of you walking that maze. It's fun, right? And we need to have those fun, joyful experiences. And then my hope is that it just sticks with you yeah. in a different way. We're planning a whole campaign this fall about why play is important because we've been getting, every now and then we'll get a review that's like, oh, this is a play space. And our director of external affairs is like, I just wanna say thank you. <laughs> yes, we are a place where you play and that's what we wanna do. So Ginger, you're an environmental advocate and you empower young people in so many ways. How are you harnessing the potential of young learners and what made you so passionate about that work? Yeah, I mean, I think you guys just hit it, but I was thinking while you were talking about how I learn best and how, as a meteorologist, I should say, I wanted to not only be Helen Hunt, that's what I went to college to be. I went and took college courses that I got credit when I saw a tornado. So that's actually what I went to school to do. Mm. And that is, it's not imaginative, it's real life play, but it is the best way to learn, is to be immersed in it. Now, I don't think that <laughs> I'm going to get a good program getting a bunch of 10-year-olds to go storm chasing with me, because I don't know that that's safe or a good idea. Uh, but there is something, when it comes to climate and climate science, that has to be that way, too. So I think what I've been inspired to do when I do my pieces, we did a piece about um, anxiety and teens. We, we Kind of worked, ABC worked with Teen Vogue and did a bunch of um, interactive work, but also followed those folks. We had one young woman who started a composting um, group. Basically, her neighbors were like, ew, I don't want to do it. And she's like, how would I do it for you? She starts doing it, almost like community gardening, and then it became so big, and then everybody got into it. And she, she single-handedly changed her neighborhood. By taking that action, her anxiety about food waste was gone. Mm -hmm. So how I, that doesn't answer your question, except that I wanted to play off of how these kids are doing really, really unbelievable things. Because I don't think, I love composting, but I'm not about to go get my neighbor's crap. Like, right. I, don't, <laughs> I don't think I'm that motivated but we have to utilize that. Um, so how do I, I want to answer your question correctly. How do I use for children, basically? How do I yeah. bring the science? Why are you to passionate, about, passionate empa about empowering those young learners? Through, right. through the books you've written, you've yes. done so, and through yeah. everyday education. Yeah, I think that's- always inspired to help the, that next generation. That's the thing is, I have all this privilege of being able to be in the place where I'm learning as I go and I'm playing as I go. So I'm passionate about giving that opportunity to other people. When I joined this board, you, you all said the real key word to me and that's giving the spark. Had I not seen Helen Hunt, I wouldn't have known that that's what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. We can't count on Hollywood because the science in that movie was terrible. <laughs> um, but we can count on places like children's museums or like pieces that I can do for ABC or books that I can write. And I wrote a trilogy um, just based on if I had been a 10-year-old <laughs> that was a storm chaser and you follow along because all of those stories are playful. They're imaginative and they're fictional, but they also incorporate real life events that I've lived and that we put into a book. And so I think that's, 
if I have any legacy, it's not just to say I was one of the few first you know, female storm chasers. It's that I actually could inspire someone else to then go figure out the puzzle that is the atmosphere because they got excited by something I left behind. I had the opposite reaction to Twister, I will say. <laughs> I never wanted to be anywhere near a tornado. You know so They're shooting the other one right now, yeah. and everybody that I know, all the storm chasers that I've known, we've all reached out to see if we can help, because we're like, we just, we love it, we just, it could be better this time, you know, like, yeah. the science doesn't have to be bad to make it good, and nobody has gotten any response. Yeah. I, like, checked in with my agent yesterday, I'm like, you sure? Do they, <laughs> do they need no? me? Do they need do they me? Tapping me I don't even want to be in it, I just want to make sure they don't get radar and satellite mixed up. I mean, I... <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, really bad. Did they really? Oh, that's horrible. Okay. Um, obviously, our schools are also a very important part of this equation. So, Kim, can you share how the EPA is supporting educators and school systems in effectively teaching environmental science? Yeah, that's a good question. When we think of, you know, like rising sea levels, when we think of toxic waste or any other major environmental issue that we face today, it really comes back to the people who do this work every day to make change possible. And when those people come from a background filled with an education that inspired them and gave them the skills to you know, push boundaries and open up doors even wider, we get that much closer to creating that clean and safe planet that we all want. Uh, one of the things that we do in my office, which is the Office of Public Engagement and Environmental Education, is we run the National Teacher Training Program. Mm. And that program is really cool because we get to train formal as well as non-formal environmental educators, and they're the ones who are sparking the imagination of our youth and giving them the skills that they need to find climate solutions. So we train the trainers, so to speak. Another thing that we do is we run our grant program and we help to train students, teachers, and communities um, through resources around environmental education so that they can figure some things out for their own communities. Uh, we love doing this, this sort of thing and we just, um, was it recently, I think um, I found out that we'll be awarding over $3 million to uh, more than 30 programs across EPA's 10 regions. So we're excited about that and excited to hear what they do. And I can share more around those initiatives, but I'll pause right there and just point you towards our website at epa.gov education. There you can find resources, um, lesson plans, project ideas, and much more. That's incredible. I did not know you were doing that program either. And I'm like, oh. we need to make sure that they all know that we have our Climate Action Heroes virtual field trip mm -hmm. available for them to oh, use wow. that ties to the cornerstone, um, the second grade cornerstone on meteorology for DC public schools, but it also ties to some environmental science education and the next generation of science standards, which is I'm sure what you're, mm -hmm. you're working towards on a national level too. So, um, so much work where we can, where we can partner. Um, and we, I'll, I'll just jump in only because it makes me think about, I've, most of my career, what you do in local stations is you go and you visit schools. Mm -hmm. And I would visit schools and talk about meteorology because most teachers don't have the ability to know the atmosphere, and nor should they know it in depth like I do. Mm -hmm. So I would come in and I created my own, you know, interactive, really, I think it was really fun. I don't know, we have to ask the kids. <laughs> I still get kids from Chicago that will be visiting New York, and they're like 25, and they're like, you were at my school. And I'm like, when did we go to school together? They're like, no, 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 you spoke at my school. Like, oh, man, I got old. Yeah. They, they, they remember that. They remember someone coming into their classroom, but I always felt... 15 years of doing that, like I couldn't do enough. Like I, I could only visit three schools. So this type of training yeah. is now I think that I want to help because yeah. climate science, and this is what we spoke about, is even less in the education. At least there's a cornerstone of meteorology. But those two, as much as people want to separate them, they're intertwined. Yeah. And so it would be great to... And in our Climate Action Heroes virtual field trip, which has now reached schools in all 50 states, we featured real life superheroes and Ginger was our mighty meteorologist. So, you know, she can't go to every single classroom in the country, but she can through that video, right? And right. so um, we're really proud of some of that work that we've done to collaborate uh, with our peers and partner with schools in particular. So we're in a, a room here full of nonprofit leaders, business leaders, thought leaders, 
And I'd love to talk more about that cross-sector industry collaboration piece and how it will be necessary for making progress for children and families in the future. So Arthur, I'm gonna start with you. Are there examples of public-private partnerships in ACM or in children's museums work that are moving that needle for children and climate? Yeah, partnerships are so important. There's an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. Mm. If you want to go far, go together. Mm. We have to go far in this work, um, across the globe indeed, to address this climate uh, crisis. And so we are working with not just ACM, the Association of Children's Museums, but I, I've been on calls with all of the museum associations, the alphabet soup, you name them. And we're talking about how we can work together uh, to produce systemic change, at least in our field. There's also the Museum and Climate Coalition, another group um, that's uh, about museum, museums and climate. So, um, so that's happening. Um, it is also the case that uh, I am on the board of the International Council of Museums, ICOM, ICOM US. And so we have a board meeting coming up in Denver at the AM conference, uh, but we will sign on to, um, to do some work around uh, climate, uh, and there's a, a public document that people are asked to sign on, but, but ICOM, we we'll, are just gonna sign on, uh, sign on to that. So we expect not only our US museums, children's museums, but the entire field this year to be very active and publicly aligned to do this work, and at least from where we sit, we believe we can, we can have a great, a great impact. And so those partnerships are happening and forming all over the place, and we're in the middle of all of that and excited to, to push this work forward. That's amazing. So Ginger, what are your thoughts on how the media can partner with businesses and nonprofits to make progress? On yeah. the climate change front, it's hard to say partner because we're you know meant to be independent of, uh, but I think following um, is more the word. And I think that the thing that came to mind when I read this question is, are you all familiar with the wild horses in America? And there's like a pretty dramatic story that goes along on both sides. And I've told this story, and I've never had more response. Mm. Wild horses are looked at as a pest um, by many, and they have been in these huge roundups by um, the BLM, it's not Black Lives Matter, uh, but it is the Bureau of Land Management. I always have to now make sure to separate it, but BLM to me when in, in this story is gonna be that. Um, and their intention, and they tell everyone that we're do, they're doing these roundups, and what you'll see is like a helicopter over these wild horses in the American West, and they are rounding them into a, a you know, one little crate, basically. They bring trucks of them to Kentucky or Tennessee, and then they live out their lives, and the government pays for it. Um, this is because, and we've been told, and it's a very tough story to tell, because on the government side, that's about all the information you can get, is this is what they, there have been some stories done. On the other side, animal advocates have a very hard time with this. So when I told the story, I looked back, and this goes back to how can we cover, and how can we be, you know, um, instrumental in this. The wild horse in America is not native, right? It was brought here, it was cultivated, it was utilized for work, and then in that time, I was fascinated to figure out why did it go from a workhorse to building the railroads and all these things to revered as this gorgeous animal that most of us probably have a bit of animalism and think that the horse is a pretty spectacular animal. And it all comes back to one woman. Her name is Wild Horse Annie. And she was, she was the lady. She was the advocate who got into schools and motivated the children. Mm -hmm. And then motivated people, because horses were used for pet food prior to that. They were killed, they were slaughtered, and that's why their numbers weren't as large. And I'm going to this only because you had to have that advocate. And then the media worked along with and covered Annie in her you know, of course was at a distance, but also covering this woman who changed the face of a, of a horse, of what it meant to be a horse. Mm. Only until recently did this other part of the wild horse story come to be. Mm. But she really did, she, she passed law by getting children motivated, by getting the media interested, and being the face of mm. the wild horse. And then there was law passed, you couldn't mustang any longer, which is um, killing horse for, with like, mm. I forgot what the rules are. You can still kill a horse, but there's certain rules. <laughs> you 
can't do it from a truck 100 yards away. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? It's like Wyoming. Um, but that is what Wild Horse Annie did. And I think that that coverage, and this is a really far stretch unless you start to think about it in the case of today, there are people and there are youth that we could be covering that we can keep championing as the story. And that's what needs to be celebrated is the part, the solution, the humanity and the solution combined. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny, when we were reaching out to different people in the media about coming to this event, we were reaching out to some journalists that I think are often covering kind of the scary stories. Mm -hmm. You know, the reporters that are writing about like this urgency, like they want you to feel that sense of urgency. And I was talking to one of them, you know, this is the great thing about living in DC is I, I have a friend who's um, son goes to school with my son, and he is a climate change reporter. And he said, yeah, you know, they covered this unit at school, and my son came home and said, is it too late? And I was like, that's exactly what my son said. He said, is it too late, you know? And, um, and I was like, this is a chance to go cover, like, some of the good work yeah. that's happening to make them hopeful. Um, well, that's the, the show that I did at Wild Horse Annie. It, um, was, it's called It's Not Too Late. That's actually the series right. that I did. Right. Because if you title it that as well, it's not just that we're playing this demo of, oh my gosh, we have to have solutions-based reporting, but you do. I think in every story, and that's what gives, and we'll get there, but that's what gives me the hope is that almost every story that I've ever told, we have something, we have ingenuity, we have adaptation, and we have the beauty of being human is that we can do all these things. We have the ability to make that choice and we can choose better. That's great. Mm. So Kim, mm -hmm. I'm gonna, anything to add to this about what private public partnerships might look like to really make a lasting change in climate resiliency? Yeah, yeah I have a few things I wanna say. <laughs> <laughs> so climate change is undoubtedly, as we've been discussing it, the largest environmental challenge of our lifetime and we must act, act like it, you know? It didn't just show up here, it's been progressively getting worse. And so according to estimates from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, in order to reach net zero by 2050, the United States will need to mobilize approximately $2 trillion in incremental capital over the next decade. And that's just one part of it. Public funding and government action will also play a critical role. But those resources alone won't ultimately help us to reach our goals. We need to retrofit buildings to make sure they're more energy efficient. We need to invest in grid resilience. And we need to employ, deploy rather, clean energy technologies across communities across the US. We need to do all of these things and then more. <laughs> you know, it's just not enough. And the private and public sectors, they have a role in this as well. They must work together to combine resources and make sure that people across the country have the resources they need to tackle these ambitious and necessary issues. And we need to do them very quickly. So we're relying on all the partners here, partners like you, to close the gap and to um, help us to get to these goals a little faster. And connected to this, we have to make sure that we're spreading environmental education, starting with our youngest. They're the ones who we need to make sure that we give them the resources they need to act and become part of these solutions. You know, I love that we're doing an event like this because this is the room where these conversations begin to happen. We're already seeing connections here. Mm -hmm room where it begins to happen. Why do I think I have a Hamilton song in my hand? <laughs> <laughs> what happens? But uh, I won't strike out in song. But um, these are when we start you know, having the conversations to see that, you know what, our goals do align. You know, we do have things that we, we can collaborate on. And so if you haven't already, I would encourage you, you know, meet someone that you haven't met before. I know I have. Mm -hmm have those conversations to figure out how we can do this work together and keep this movement going. That's so great and a perfect segue because my last question is what you're most hopeful about in this space. What makes you hopeful? Anyone, j jump on in, Arthur. Um, I'll start um, okay. and, and it builds on what Kim and Ginger were speaking about because both of them talked about talking with young people, working with young people, and it's young people that give me faith. And I want to read just a quick uh, few uh, excerpts from the um, 
and I didn't bring the, the right sheet. Uh, Amanda Gorman, the poet laureate, has a wonderful poem on, um, on climate change. And it's a video as well. And you really ought to see it. And, uh, uh, and I was going to read some excerpts from it. And I didn't. It's, it's in the back. But <laughs> nevertheless, um, I'm hopeful because she and, and Greta and other young people are getting engaged and getting involved. The young people I see in our museums are getting involved. And I know that um, because of that involvement and our uh, engagement as adults, that we have a chance. And as Ginger said, it's not too late. So I'm hopeful. I'm, I'm hopeful for many reasons, but you know, climate change, in most of my career, I, I told you I was a meteorologist, but I grew up on a farm in Michigan. My first home had geothermal heat and wood burning fire, and we were off the grid. My father's an immigrant, he's from the Netherlands, and most of that was because he didn't want to pay the man. Mm. Uh, which is, but, but it was also because the environment was important. And so I grew up on a small farm. We, I grew up like a lot of people don't, and like a lot of people think they dream to, to like go make jam when they're retiring. Um, but I was able to see as I got into the world that that's not how everybody lives and that's not the way that the world works. And being the environmental reporter, even when I met Crystal back in, at NBC in Chicago, I've always been that person and it was, it was a tougher sell. The last three years, it's not as tough. Mm -hmm. We are seeing a real change in interest across the board. It doesn't matter what age you are. Uh, Bill McKibben you know, leads the... Uh, what is their name? It's, it's basically anybody 65 or older who wants to be a climate activist. Um, you've got... 350.org? Yes, yes. What is it? Is it 350.org? 350, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, you've got Benji Backer, who is the head of the ACC. I just had breakfast with him recently. I actually did a whole profile on him for Nightline. He would hate for me to say this. This is recorded. Sorry, Benji, if you see this. But like the Greta of the right. Right? He's the conservative mm. environmentalist mm. that is going to make that, if we have one place that I think that we can get there on, it's here. Mm -hmm. It's not anymore, is it a thing? I don't get asked that when I do speeches anymore. I don't, do you believe is not the question. Mm -hmm. What we do about it is where we can politically divide but it's also where we can politically come together. So I have great hope when I have breakfast with Benji and we're talking about small reactors, small nuclear reactors, and what is the future of that? And what is it, how does private drive the financial clean future of not just the United States, but the world? That gives me great hope because it's well beyond and it's in those rooms where it happens, where those talks are happening. And I really think he gets into rooms that someone may not be able to get into rooms, and he's going to be that uh, liaison. Mm -hmm. That's good. Okay. You know, what gives me hope is, you know, our youth. We've, we've talked about that. You know, we talked about climate change today and, you know, how the impacts are scary. And we also talked about how we can have these critical conversations in a way that doesn't just come from a place of fear. And so that's why I think hope really must lead us towards change and it, we should let hope lead the way and when I get to meet students and young people they're the ones who are reimagining what their futures could look like they inspire me um, they're the ones who are sounding the alarm it's our youth they're the ones who are sparking these global conversations you mentioned Greta and there's a lot of Greta's out there mm -hmm. but they're the ones who are you know, saying, hey, we need to not only talk about climate change, but we need to talk about the future that we fundamentally want to create. And um, I've shared this with my, my um, panelists here, my co-panelists, but I recently became a grandmother. <laughs> I'm Gigi now. <laughs> but um, when I hold her and I look down at her sweet little face, I think about her future. Mm. And when I talk to those students and those youth out there, I think about their futures too. And they will live in the world that we decide to create today. Those decisions, they happen right now, each and every day. Mm -hmm. And so what gives me hope is their creativity, their innovation, their tenacity, because they're not going to give up. They're fighting for their own future, and they're the ones who are giving me the inspiration to keep going every day. We have no choice. We have to do it. That's yeah. Right. yeah, I love that. I mean, it's exactly that for me. Obviously, we have seen throughout history how children have been at the forefront of affecting real change. 
but everyone loves their kids and their grandkids. And you have to believe that when they're telling you, we care about this, we want this to change. I mean, 84% mm -hmm. are worried. I mean, their, their parents are coming from very different backgrounds. Their caregivers are coming from very different backgrounds. You have to believe that they want to affect change for them. So hopefully we will find that common ground and, and really start to um, make some headway. We're gonna transition now to a Q&A. Hello. Um, <laughs> okay, cool. uh, hi, everybody. So I recently was going down a rabbit hole and was researching how many trees would I need to offset my total carbon emissions each year. And I thought in my head it would be like 20. And then I found out it was I would need to plant at least about like 700 trees per year to offset my carbon emissions. And for me, that was really tangible, really helped me understand why we're in this climate crisis. And I thought about how few students understand any bits of carbon accounting. Mm -hmm. So I think my, I had two questions. One was, do you see anyone educating young people about carbon accounting in a way that is playful? Uh, like who's doing that well? Or how could we do that well? Because uh, I had definitely read the studies of how impactful that can be. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was curious about that. You're at the right table, the Arbor Avenger table. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've seen the attention, obviously, on the nutrition label of clothes, for example, that have started becoming more popular. Um, you see it in restaurants here and there with the carbon. So like a nutrition label has given us a value, um, sometimes to, hurts us, um, but to, to give us a value to what we are consuming both in our world, because that's the other thing is, so often, transportation is vilified because that's the first one we think about. But what we're eating and how far it took to get there and what we're wearing likely had a whole lot more impact than our entire year of commuting on um, whatever it is that we chose to commute, even if it's a personal vehicle. Um, and then how big of a deal that is compared to recycling. Recycling did a really great job uh, educating kids because that's where it usually starts in schools. There are programs, but recycling is so horrendous and doesn't do what it's meant to do that I think we should use, I mean, this is me talking big talk over here. I think we should lose recycle from the reduce reuse because it shouldn't be there any longer. <laughs> the intent is right, but the reducing and the reusing is where the attention should be. So do I think anybody's doing it well aside from it just just now starting to show up. And this is, you know, in my world in New York City. So I know it's not at home in Grand Rapids, Michigan. You're not looking up at a menu and seeing a carbon emission next to it. But I hope that that's what we will get to because it needs to be well beyond just the education because we need to educate everybody. And that would be a really easy way to do it is to put the nutrition label of carbon on it. Mm -hmm. And how do you make that fun though, right? Like, and I will say, I have to note, the 700 trees, I'm trying to get a story done because we've had a tip from these groups in Louisiana who they have orders from all these companies who have ordered the, you know, offset your, your whatever by planting a tree. They have so many of those orders years in, basically in line because there's no one to plant the trees because we don't have the workforce or the labor, and there's this, we're, we're trying to do the story and it's hard because there's a law right now in hospitality, the, anybody who comes from a different country and is meant to work, um, there's a limit on those workers per city, per county, per something. And basically these programs that have been hired out as a third party by a lot of the big companies to do these offsets can't plant the trees because they can't get a person to dig a hole to plant the tree because we don't have the workforce, which is a crazy story. So mm -hmm. that's, not to, that's not answering your question, but I thought really important. Because <laughs> your 700 trees might not be being planted. <laughs> right. Mobilize the schools, little Arbor Avengers out there in the dirt. Yeah, uh, you know, I think there's a great question. I also think, though, that some of our younger kids, believe it or not, they are starting to, to get it. Um, one of our awardees last year, Raul, Raul's in the fifth grade. And he and his family volunteer at their local community garden. And so he's, you know, of course, his parents are making the trek to and from the garden. It got Raul to thinking, how much uh, is our vehicle emitting 
you know, uh, carbon emissions are, are being emitted by our, our vehicle on the trip to the garden from home. And he started to not only think about it, he started to add it up and calculate it. Fifth grade now. So then he came up with a, a, a solution. He decided to reach out to the other community uh, gardeners and said, okay, uh, when do you come? And they, he got all of their schedules and they coordinated. And so they decided that um, on this day when I come, I'll, I will not only water my garden, but I'll, I'll water yours too. And so he did the math and came up with um, a, a figure of how much he had saved simply by coming up with that simple solution. He took it a step further and said, well, how much water are we using yeah. mm -hmm. to water these, these plants? And then he introduced hydroponics into you know, what they're doing around caring for the plants. So I think our youngest generations, when I say they get it, mm -hmm. they get it. And they're the ones who are teaching their peers about how they can think outside the box and be innovative and creative in the same way. Amazing. Anything to add? No, all good responses. Anyone else? Questions? Thank you. Um, announces candidacy for presidents, and um, he, to me, strikes me as a guy who's really kind of walking the, the talk as far as uh, as it relates to the environment. Um, he formed River Keepers, which is credited with helping uh, make the Hudson River swimmable again. And I'd like to, I'd wonder what your thoughts are on his candidacy and compare that with the, the present administration. I think for all candidates or people, you know, I know there are groups that are looking at who is doing great work um, in climate change, right? And uh, advocating for climate change. I don't know how much involvement the EPA has with this or, mm -hmm. or not, but there are groups that do that work, aren't there? So if I'm hearing correctly, I, I can't weigh in on a candidacy. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, I can tell you that, you know, what we're seeing with this administration is that it's going further and faster than ever before when we think about tackling climate, hit, the climate crisis and really head on. Uh, within days of taking office, President Biden signed an executive order 14008 which is to make sure that a certain part of federal investments, 40% for that matter, go into marginalized, overburdened, and underserved communities. That's never happened before. So environmental justice is one of those central elements of this administration that um, I'm really excited to be a part of. Um, I, as I told uh, the three of you, I, I was doing something else when I got a phone call to say, hey, would you like to come and work for this administration? And I was working in environmental justice and liked what I was doing. But then I thought about it, if not now, when? Mm -hmm. As we, we've discussed, time is ticking. And we've got to, you know, we really need to do something now. And so I would think about, you know, who's doing things out there in their communities? Who, who's making the difference? And those are the ones that you can tap into to, to really, um, you know, find out what their solutions are and hopefully be a part of broadening that and scaling that up. And I just wanted to respond to that without getting into the uh, candidate question, but I do think we should query any candidate for any office and ask him or her, what are your plans mm -hmm. right, for climate action mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and climate regeneration? So we ought to ask that. I looked at, you know, I was in, interviewed for this job in this museum in that room back there. <laughs> and I recently looked at, this is my 13th month on the job, and I, I looked at my position description. Uh, it said nothing about climate or environment. It was, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of other wonderful things that I was charged to do. That was not one. The board in the plan, we figured it out. But every job, mm -hmm. significant job, so to ask, so how, how are you, by the way, yes, you're going to generate revenue, you're going to build membership, you're going to do all that, but how are you going to protect the planet? How are you going to take care of children, make the water, air safer for all of us? And so that's something we can do, not just with candidates, but with principals, superintendents, mm -hmm. with anyone in any significant job. I agree. And I think that that 
as a candidate, what he's doing is making it easier because I can say in the last election, my coverage was wait, I was waiting for it to be an issue that we could talk about and cover. Mm -hmm. And it was only one question within one of the debates. Mm -hmm. It was, it, it takes such a back seat. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I can't speak to him because I haven't read through everything and I, I don't know. It's great that he has proof of performance on the Hudson though. I love that. Um, but to be able to have any candidate state up front mm -hmm. and make that a priority should be everybody's priority. No matter what side, no matter what conservation is built into conservative, right? And that's what Benji would, would say. And so that is a critical part of every platform, or should be. And it would be great if it didn't have to be dug for underneath. And granted, there are other huge, huge issues. But if we are going to have something where we're going to have a come together moment. It may just be this. So yeah. I hope that that's the case. Yeah, me too. Because I mean, I think that was a Seinfeld episode, wasn't it? Swimming in the Hudson. Like we probably, mm -hmm. so it's been a little bit of time that we should have been working on the Hudson. Um, and I think all of these groups that are advocating for children are coming together. Like the American Academy of Pediatrics, yeah. they did, they have a climate change group that came and lobbied on the Hill. Um, you know, and I think I see every day here in this museum, I know who we're serving here on Pennsylvania Avenue. We're serving members of Congress and their kids and staff members and their grandkids and it's policymakers that are coming through here. So I feel like we have a responsibility to, to do this work and empower them every single day. Other questions, thoughts? John, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so throughout history, obviously we've seen children align uh, together uh, on a range of issues. More on the side of altruism or morals or ethics, and then as they get older, we start to divide and put ourselves in one camp or another. Obviously, we know Gen Z is incredibly interested in climate. As the experts in this, is the conventional wisdom that as Gen Z gets older and you know becomes players in the economy, they'll continue to stay on the side of climate change and climate action, or is there an assumption that there's going to be an inflection point where eventually we're still so early in this movement in some ways? that you know, Gen Z will eventually divide and find themselves on one side of the issue or the other? And if so, what is that inflection point? How do we insert ourselves you know, there? It's a good question. I think it has to be, everything takes forever, um, but not forever in that I, I'm only playing on what I know from, from the data that we've gotten about interest in it because as prior to three years ago when the data actually changed so that I could prove to my bosses that people really want this. It was the first time, and I do think that there is a shift. I can't put a percentage on that, except that I can tell you that it feels large enough to be that maybe it's less divided. <laughs> of course there will be division, right? Just like with everything. Um, but it's more about and maybe more informed about where that divide goes in that it's not about the science being divided, which is unfortunate for medicine that they've gone through now what meteorology and climatology have gone through for 50 years. Um, we've, it was weird to watch another science do that and it be fresh. And it was like, no, my entire career has been trying to prove to people that we actually know something about the world around us. We don't know everything, but it's a, it's a lesson. And what I've seen meteorology and climatology do better now is that we have gotten better about telling you what we know and what we don't know. And that transparency has allowed, I think, will allow Gen Z or any gen coming up to feel more um, transparent and like they're actually part of the story and understand that science isn't perfect, but that we take what we know until it is scientific law, right? And like Gravity, we're all pretty sure of. Um, <laughs> it's going to take time. But it took 50 years already for us to say the physics of adding heat to your planet. And it took us 50 years to get here. I don't know what it's going to take for medicine, you know, to go back. And they've gone through some evolutions of witch hunting and such. So, like, we've all kind of seen that in science. But it would be great if this is the turning point, And it feels like it is. I hope so. Yeah. You know, I hope that we never have to answer that question. Yeah. I hope that, like, mm -hmm. by getting to children young, mm -hmm. that it affects long-lasting change. I was thinking about research that the American Academy of Pediatric did about how young racial bias is set, for example. Mm -hmm. And it was a study that they went back and did, and they were like, okay, by the age of eight, we know racial bias is set, right? I hope that what we learn about climate change education is that as soon as they get it, they get it, mm -hmm. and that this study never happens. Um, so that would be my answer, is that we reach these kids young, 
and we affect real change that way. And don't you think the money will drive it? I mean, in the end, that is what will drive it. So if these financial availabilities, they're not going to then dive into their lives and not be a part of it because it will be part of the solution. And so I guess that's what also I would think changes now is that maybe it's because I've been talking to 10 different small nuclear companies this week, but um, <laughs> wow. It's changing really fast. <laughs> so, we just little Amanda yes, Amanda. absolutely. So, to close us out, do you want to yes. share Amanda? I, I, I now have it. Amanda. It's called Earthrise. It's not the whole poem because it's a <laughs> long. I just put some some excerpts. We've known that we've caught that we're caught in the throes of climactic changes. Some say, will it just go away? While some simply pray to survive another day, for it is the obscure, the oppressed, the poor who, when the disasters declared done, still suffer more than anyone. Climate change is the single greatest challenge of our time. You don't need to be a politician to make it your mission to conserve, to protect, to preserve that one and only home that is ours, to use your unique power to give the next generations the planet they deserve. We are demonstrating, creating, advocating. We need this inconvenient truth because we need to be anything but lenient with the future of our youth. For it is our hope that implores us at our uncompromising uncom core to keep rising up for an earth more than worth fighting for. Mm. Amanda Gorman, our youth poet laureate. But go see the whole video because it's <laughs> phenomenal. And, and, it, and it just, I think if that, you, you see that video doesn't inspire you, then go talk to your doctor. I think. <laughs> I think you gave that poem real justice, so thank yes, you. you. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank, thank you to you. our panelists.